Welcome to A House Divided. My name is Bjorn Skaptason, and you are watching us today at Abraham Lincoln Bookshop. Thank you very much for returning to A House Divided. You are watching us on our Facebook feed. Of course, if you're watching, you know that. If during the course of this conversation, you have any questions for our author, please leave them in the comments section of Facebook. And uh, I will jump in and out of this discussion and I may jump in and ask some of your questions as we go. Please feel free to ask questions and make comments in the comments section. Be nice, we're all in this pandemic together. Uh, today we are featuring Professor Lucas Morell and his book, Lincoln and the American Founding. I'm gonna add a link to where you can buy that from Abraham Lincoln Bookshop. If you do that, we will include a signed book plate Thank you, Professor Morell, for doing that for us, and we will ship it right out to you. So without further ado, let's get the conversation that you have tuned in to watch started, and I will toss this conversation right off to your host, Daniel Weinberg of Abraham Lincoln Bookshop. Welcome, everybody. I'm glad you're here with us, and you know, A House Divided is our usual format for author interviews, and uh, We've been, I'm very excited actually to have Lucas Morell with us. Uh, and I'll tell you why, because I'm going to give you his quick bio here. He's a professor of politics and head of politics department of Washington and Lee University. He's the honored visiting professor in American history at Ashland University. I knew it as Ashland College years ago because it was a hmm. Civil War show now in Mansfield, Ohio, that used to be at Ashland. And I'll say this, uh, maybe Lucas, you can say it's still the same, the best college food I've had anywhere is at <laughs> yeah, Ashland College, their, now University. It's one of their selling points, yes. Oh, great, I missed it when we went to Mansfield. Uh, he's a trustee of the Supreme Court Historical Society, former president of the Abraham Lincoln Institute. And he's a member of the U.S. Semi-Quincentennial Commission, a new word to me, Semi-Quincentennial Commission. Uh, he's the author uh, of a number of books, include Lincoln and Liberty, Wisdom for the Ages, Lincoln's Sacred Effort, Defining Religion's Role in American Self-Government. His latest book, the one for today, is Lincoln and the American Founding, uh, part of the Concise Lincoln Library uh, uh, series. I think it's a 26th title now. I think they're going to wow. go to 28 or 29. That's it. Southern Illinois University Press, 162 pages, and it's $24.95 and worth every penny, by the way. Fascinating <laughs> book. I enjoyed it, Lucas. So, Thank you. your introduction is titled Looking to the Past for the sake of the future. Seems a priori to me, but what do you tell your students of history's import to them, of the importance of civic memory? Yeah, memory is an important thing for me. Uh, thank you again for inviting me on the show, Danielle. Uh, Daniel, it's been uh, too long since we've last uh, uh, met true. at the, the usual places, uh, the, link, the usual Lincoln haunts the, and the Holy Land as we call Springfield, Illinois. Um, we call I, I, it here in, in Chicago, the Holy Land ourselves. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, one of the reasons why I like, I have a very particular interest in history is because my favorite speech of Lincoln's is all about history. And that was the second inaugural, uh, second inaugural address. Um, it was a, a speech where he basically thought we could not move forward as a country unless we moved back first. That unless we look to the past, the most recent past, and try to come up with a, what, what, what I call a public memory of the enormity of the war and the surprise of emancipation. But more broadly speaking, uh, I think history helps us understand who we are. It under helps us get, if you will, kind of a step back from where we are in our place. And I think it helps clarify certain things, especially in moments of crisis, uh, moments of confusion. And when we need some clarity, I think when you have a past that in Lincoln's mind and in mine as well, when you have a past that has some very important, good and noble and true things, those are the things you need to be reminded of that will help uh, be a beacon as it were to your path and to the future. So 
Um, uh, as I've been telling people, if you want to know about the founding, one great place to start is by getting to know Lincoln. Well, do you consider perhaps this book a civic lesson, uh, something that the schools have dropped out of curricula? Uh, absolutely. I think if, if you come away from the book thinking more deliberately about what the requirements are for perpetuating self-government, which if there was one theme that animated Lincoln's political life, it was precisely that. His first great speech in 1838, when he was in the second of four straight terms as a state legislator in Illinois, the title of it was on, our, uh, on the perpetuation of our political institutions. Lincoln thought this was not something that happened automatically, that there were certain ideas and certain structures that you had to have to perpetuate or keep uh, the Republic going. And so uh, this is not a trip down memory lane or some mere nostalgic exercise. Uh, knowing our past, knowing our history is a key, uh, I think, uh, and Lincoln believed it was key to helping um, keep uh, democracy, helping keep freedom alive. Well, I, this next question I had already posed, and then I found out that your project right now is exactly on this. I was going to ask, how aware were the American people themselves at the time of the newness of the Republican democracy, the Republican democracy and its fragility? The War of 1812 had to have been a scare. And I find that you're working on Lincoln rates and the fragile American Republic. So yeah. did they, did the public themselves know about, feel their newness and that they might be taken out War of 1812 again? Yeah, I would, I would say that that was a more on the front burner, certainly in the, the, the years and decade leading up to the Civil War. So basically the 1850s, that was a front burner issue for them. Not so much in 1838. Uh, in fact, I, I see, or 1839, um, uh, um, uh, when Lincoln delivered that speech, Lincoln uh, was commenting, I mean, he delivered it in 1838, but he was actually responding in a way to Martin Van Buren's inaugural address, where Martin Van Buren was not worried about the perpetuation of the union. Even Daniel Webster, there's a speech that I talk about in my book, where Daniel Webster says, well, now that the founding has happened, our job, we don't get to do that anymore. As spectacular and awesome as that is, our job is to uh, practice, as it were, the arts of peace. And Webster thought that this was more something that dealt with our emotions, our sentiments, our feelings, Whereas in Lincoln's speech, of course, he emphasizes our reason, our deliberation. Uh, and so I would say in Lincoln's day, Lincoln saw mobs forming in pursuit of justice, and that freaked him out. It did not freak out the president of the United States at that time, Van Buren. And Lincoln wa wanted to call our attention to that and to show that this thing that has been going on first, you know, a generation or two, uh, was something that was the responsibility of every generation to keep going. It wasn't a perpetual motion machine by any stretch of the imagination. And as I say, there's a certain way of thinking and acting as citizens that Lincoln believed was not optional, was essential to maintain our structures of freedom, uh, the rule of law, and the vitality uh, and expansion of freedom. Now, what books influenced Lincoln as he was reading and growing up the way he could. Uh, what were the influencers that he, we know that he read? As you mentioned in the book, we're not positive he, he read John Locke, but did he read, read the Federalist Papers, for instance? Yeah, that, that's an awesome question. I teach the Federalist Papers pretty much every year, and I've been teaching for over a quarter century now. It sounds weird even to say that. Um, in, it's, it's striking that I see no clear evidence that Lincoln read the Federalist Papers. We know he read Euclid's Elements because he told us he did when he was a congressman for one term. When he should have been reading the Federalist, he was reading uh, the standard uh, geometry textbook. But the fact of the matter is, he thought you, you, were, you couldn't really consider yourself a learned, uh, you know, uh, a, a sharp witted person uh, unless you knew your geometry. And so that's what he took up, right? He was essentially uh, self-taught, you know, maybe went to school a total of, of 12 months in his life, what he called blab schools. So what did he read? He read volumes of Jefferson's writings. He read the uh, standard texts that had excerpts, if not whole speeches of George Washington. 
We know he read the Bible, but I'm just focusing on political things. He read Eliot's debates, uh, the debates, the, the accounts of the, the Constitutional Convention. Remember, Madison kept those, his own notes, um, uh, confidential. I mean, uh, he gave them to Washington, who eventually gave them to the Library of Congress, but Madison gave them strict instructions that these were not to be made public until after he died. And so he wanted the nation itself to live under a constitution without, as it were, inside information. You think even about the Federalist Papers, Hamilton and James Madison, two of the three writers of the Federalists, they were at the convention and they never say so out loud in the Federalist Papers. They take the document the same way the citizens of New York take the document, as not a fait accompli, but as a finished draft that is up to the American people to decide what it means for them and how they should operate under it. So no, Lincoln did not read the Federalists as far as we know. He wasn't much given to po uh, political philosophy. He loved political economics. So he read Francis Wayland, uh, among other people, uh, devoured Shakespeare. But the argument of my book is the most important influence on Lincoln in terms of his political thought and practice was, uh, if you had to put your finger on one thing, it's the Declaration of Independence. But what about Rousseau and Burke? I mean, was he, did he no. get into any of that? No, I think uh, Alan Gelzo, a good friend of ours, argues for John Stuart Mill as possibly something that Lincoln, and fairly certain he read that. But, you know, somebody who did read more widely than Lincoln, Lincoln was, was not a wide reader, but he was a deep reader, okay? Mm -hmm. um, Herndon would throw him books uh, to read, and Lincoln would page through a few, and then he would just put them down. Wasn't interested in biographies, wasn't interested in novels, wasn't interested in philosophy. He devoured books on economics and, polit and political economics. Well, how about the people around him? How about Henry Clay and Daniel Webster? He must have been reading them besides Jefferson and Washington to, to influence that, influence yes, him. For sure. for sure. He famously called Clay his beau ideal of a statesman, which if you, uh, the more I read of Clay, the more I see that Lincoln highlights certain things of Clay and downplays some other things. Same thing with Jefferson. There's a lot that he plays up on uh, Jefferson, who's, you know, a Democrat, not a Republican, or at least not a national Republican. Uh, but there are certain things about Jefferson that, that Lincoln is studiously quiet about. So, uh, yes, he read, and he read John Quincy Adams. Good grief. John Quincy Adams dies in, on the floor of Congress, at the one term that Lincoln is actually in Congress, and Lincoln is actually appointed to one of the committees to set up uh, the funeral for, for JQA. Well, Washington, of course, is already passed by the time Lincoln is born, but Jefferson's still alive. And he, was, uh, he died when Lincoln was 17. So, and, he, and you say in your book that he did not think of much of him as a politician. How no. did he, why did he get into that? Uh, why did he feel that? And did he, did he read any Jefferson as, as Jefferson was writing at the time while he was alive? Yeah, he did read volumes of Jefferson's writings, um, especially his state papers. Uh, notes on the state of Virginia, we know he read because Lincoln makes more than one reference in more than one place to a particular chapter, chapter 18 called On Manners, which is really a, a book, it's a chapter, it's one long paragraph about slavery and the adverse impact it has on the manners of Virginians and Jefferson should know, right? So he definitely read Jefferson. Um, uh, so yeah, um, it, it, Jefferson state papers and what was part of the volumes of, of Jefferson's writings that were coming out, which included the notes on the state of Virginia. Now, we're gonna get into the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, which are the, the heart of your book. Uh, but you talk about the American creed, and that's the genius of America, the devotion to creed rather than blood. Uh, my father, who was born in Ukraine, when he gave talks, and he gave many, used to talk about our forefathers. I said, my dad, I said, you know, your forefathers, you were born in Ukraine. What do you mean? How close were you to Jefferson and Madison? But that's what happens. You inculcate that when you come in here. So please talk briefly about creed to us. Yeah, I, I think we use the word creed today because of Martin Luther King Jr. In his I Have a Dream speech, he referred to the American creed. He referred to having a dream that was deeply rooted in the American dream. So what became a creed, a creed by the time of the, mo uh, the modern civil rights movement, by Lincoln's time, certainly was a creed in his mind, uh, and in his mind, more specifically, a promise that he hoped 
would come to fruition, which of course tragically didn't happen for another century as Lincoln, as, uh, as King pointed out. Uh, but, but in 1858, Lincoln gives this wonderful speech in Chicago where he talks about the, the, the electric cord that links the hearts of all freedom and liberty loving people. He said, there are people in our midst that can, can trace their heritage back to the fathers by blood. But then he says, you look around and you see all these other people who consider themselves bone of the bone and flesh of the flesh of the fathers, even though they're not lineal blood descendants. They look back to what? Our ancient faith, the declaration, when it says all men are created equal. And Lincoln says, ah, that's the father of all moral principle in them. In other words, they think like Americans. It's not that they look like Americans. We're, we look, we're, you know, we're mutts, right? What, you want to know what an American looks like? You ask him what he believes, not his last name, not where his parents from. My parents were uh, immigrants from the Dominican Republic. Uh, they came here and they had their green card until they were naturalized as American citizens. I happened to be born in Manhattan, New York, as you can tell by my accent. Ha ha. I was raised in California. There's my accent. Uh, so Lincoln got his finger on something that he thought was very important, which was that what makes you American is what you believe about humanity, about rights, about government by consent of the governed, and even something as radical as the right of revolution, that these were things that you have by nature, not by birth, not by wealth, not by family name, not by um, uh, nation of origin. These were things simply by adoption, if you will. Again, before we get to the two main topics here, uh, the Northwest Ordinance was very important of 1787. That was yes. important to Lincoln as well, and he harkened back to that. Quickly tell us about that. Yeah, the Northwest Ordinance was an ordinance, a statute passed in 1787 as the Constitutional Convention was meeting. Uh, the, when the Articles of Confederation and Perpetual Union, the, the Constitution at that time in 1787, when that Congress met, there was a portion of land called the Northwest Ordinance that was the only federal territory in the possession of the American people at large. And so Congress decided we need to organize this territory because it will eventually become, uh, you know, states will be carved out of it. And Article 6, I believe, uh, was an article that banned slavery from that territory. And Lincoln invested a lot in that. He, he read the founders' intentions with regards to their hopes for the nation. In their minds, debatable point, but in their minds, they did not believe they could free themselves and free their slaves at the same time during the American Revolution, the Revolutionary War. And so what Lincoln says is, in spite of the fact that they did not get rid of slavery right away, we see signs early on, legislative ones, that indicated what kind of country they thought they were erecting. And it was a free republic, not a slaveholding one, even though slavery was already in their midst. So that ordinance passed in 1787 was reauthorized in the first Congress under Washington. And Washington signed the Northwest Ordinance again under the new constitution. And Lincoln said, see, this is one way we know that the founders did not intend for slavery to stick around. Now, of course, the Lyceum address was a major point, starting point for Lincoln. That address that he did uh, was certainly early, uh, early expression of the Declaration of Independence in his mind and how important it was. Lincoln, of course, was asking the nation to return to the true aim of the revolution, equality of all human beings, as you said. And that was the older understanding. So what did Lincoln feel had happened if that was the older understanding? What was the newer understanding or the new faith that Lincoln felt perhaps had gone off track? Yeah, well, the new faith, I mean, this is a, it's a good uh, question to ask because we sort of assume today that there was a common understanding of these old things, if you will, what Lincoln called old fashioned ways of thinking. Um, and Lincoln saw that there were challenges to the founding, even as he was um, in, in his young adulthood. And the signs of this began with the uh, 1860 Missouri Compromise, excuse me, 1820, let's try 1820, the 1820 Missouri Compromise. Um, that was the real first sign that um, the nation was beginning to have, if you will, a schizophrenic view of itself. 
Um, you had people who no longer believed that slavery was, as Senator Cotton clumsily put it, uh, a necessary evil. Uh, that there were people like John Calhoun in 1837, a year before the Lyceum Address, Calhoun called slavery not a necessary evil, but a good, a positive good. And wait for it, good for whom? Both the master and the slave. So now you have a society and societies, American states south of the Mason-Dixon line, and now including Missouri, where the, they are now trying to justify a practice that um, most Americans believed at the time of the founding was abhorrent, namely uh, the pe peculiar institution of slavery. And so Lincoln is seeing that people are now contending with the founders. They're reinterpreting the founders, if not flat out rejecting the founders. And by the time, of course, he's elected, or at least campaigning for president in 1860, Lincoln is putting forth an interpretation of the founding that is being contested by more than one opponent. Stephen Douglas has his reading of the founders. Alexander Stevens has his reading of the founders, future vice president of the Confederacy. Jefferson Davis has his reading. And so what Lincoln really puts on the front burner for the nation in 1860, what the Republicans said was, we believe we have the proper understanding of the founding and we need to get this country back on the rails in terms of what should happen to slavery in the future. It should be put on the course of ultimate extinction. Stephen Douglas did not believe that. Alexander Stevens did not believe that. And certainly Jeff Davis did not believe that. Well, he felt there were implications to the Declaration and the Constitution. Yes. Was he, he was not a strict constructionist, really, even though he was going back to it. Uh, was strict constructionism even an issue back then? Um, they would not have used that term, but it was an issue because uh, I would argue that that's what brought forth the two-party system uh, between the Federalists and uh, the, what were known at the time as the Democratic Republicans, Jefferson's party and then uh, Madison's party. Um, the issue was, well, how robust, uh, to use uh, the Federalist language, how energetic is this proposed constitution of 1787? And energy, of course, was a euphemism for power. How centralized is this government going to be? How much authority did we really give them? What do we mean by federal or federalism? Is this a strict confederation? In other words, are we an alliance or a league of states that for the most part remain sovereign? Or do we have, as Hamilton put it in Federalist 15, a real nation, a real government? And of course, Lincoln was Hamiltonian to his bones. And so Lincoln really believed that the Constitution did have the stuff, it had energy, it had power to cement us as a people. And he got a lot of that from Henry Clay, in fact. Of course, this is the book that we're looking at right now. And if you want to get a copy signed in a wonderful book plate with a Carl Sandburg inspired logo, that's our logo on it, uh, you can get that. And of course, everyone should have the entire concise series from SIU. That's, that's me. I think everyone should have that on their shelves for themselves, for their kids, for their grandkids. It's easy to get into and get out of as well. So that's a, a very good thing about that. I was looking at the contents, and I think it tells you the structure of the book. Yeah. You, so you start with George Washington, of course, as the founder par excellence. And then uh, you talk about the Declaration as an appeal to the founder's ends. The Constitution's appeal to the founders' means, and Lincoln and slavery appeal to the founders' compromise. Then you go into original intent, an appeal to the founders' relevance, and then the conclusion that you give. So those are the chapters that are going through here. I just want to ask you something about off the, off the charts here for a moment. I just want to do, since we're going to talk about Washington, and Washington is so important to well, the country, it certainly was back then. Yes. And they always also felt that the parentheses were the revolution and then the Civil War. And of course, these are the, here's the apotheosis that uh -huh. many of you in the Lincoln field know about. They yep. just took Washington and put in Lincoln's head when he died. Uh, he another one that came morning. up that was well known, uh, this uh, wonderful piece, very colorful, not here in this book. But again, they use the same format for the two of them. And these were on people's walls. People wanted these on their walls. Here's one where, and you might know that 
This one here is Pratt with uh, the Emancipation Proclamation making his face. Here's Declaration of Independence, should have been Jefferson maybe, but I put <laughs> Washington in there uh, to show him. And uh, so they kept putting Lincoln and Washington together as Lincoln did, because he felt that he was trying to affect not change, change, but not change. And uh, so let's go to that compromise that was in the Founders Constitution. Sure. I'm writing it out. Uh, and that, of course, was over slavery. But Lincoln was saying that it was in there, but the, but the founders expected slavery to eventually go to extinction. And from the Constitution itself. Give us a brief idea about that, please. Yeah, um, and, and thank you for walking through my table of contents. The actual text, I should hasten to add, is 122 pages. So it's actually shorter than the 160 some odd that it sounds like. That includes the notes and the index. But it's a, I have been told it's a quick read, so that's good to know. Um, the way the, the, the structure of the book is that, look, if you look at the ends of the regime that are spelled out in the Declaration, and then the means to the end, which are spelled out in the structures of the Constitution, you, you come to a particular conclusion, you realize, wait a second, I see something in this means, these levers of, of national governments, uh, governance that seem inconsistent with the ends. And those things are those compromises with slavery. So I had to have a chapter on Lincoln and, and slavery because I believe that he learned and drew from the founder's approach to slavery to attempt to try to get the country back to that approach to getting rid of slavery, not in the near term because they couldn't because of federalism, right? A citizen of Illinois, a congressman or senator from Illinois couldn't touch slavery in Kentucky, in Alabama, in Florida. They had to do what they could to uh, nationally to keep slavery from spreading. They had every right to do that. And of course, people contested whether Congress had that right or not. But certainly slavery where it existed, the founders believed that that was up to those states to get rid of it. And of course, six of the original 13 did. And Lincoln believed what we learned from the founding, not just in keeping it sp like from spreading Northwest Ordinance, but also banning it as soon as they could under the Constitution, which was in 1808. The slaveholder, Thomas Jefferson, as president, signed into law in 1807 to take effect as soon as possible as soon as permissible under the Constitution, January 1, 1808, a ban on this particular article of commerce. It is the only article of commerce that has an exception as a provision of the Constitution, and that was an exception that South Carolina and Georgia demanded, or else, in my opinion, they would have walked. That would have exploded the convention. 1820, 18, uh, 12 years later, what did they do to put teeth into that, uh, into that provision? They said, now we are going to equate slavery importation with piracy. And that meant the only punishment was capital, execution. The only president to hang a person for the crime of importing slaves into the United States was Abraham Lincoln, which he did famously in February of 1862. Nathaniel uh, Gordon. The hanging of Nathaniel Gordon, yes. No, yeah. that was an interesting, uh, you just both pass it, you don't really talk about it, but, it, but it's a fascinating uh, moment that most of us had not heard of or know. Mm -hmm. um, I see that Bjorn is up, which means, thankfully, someone is listening and wants to ask a question. Great. Thank you, gentlemen. Yes, uh, actually, I'm just reporting in here about 30 minutes into our discussion to let you know that, yeah, a lot of people are watching, and, uh, and I want to send a shout out to some of them, and I do have a couple of questions to add in. But first, uh, first let me do some shout outs here. Uh, we got Bill from Abraham Lincoln Association. Bill Shepard is watching. He's a Yay. regular and we always like to see Bill here. Uh, hello to Thomas and Dan. Angela is watching. David. Dave from the UK is watching live. Wow. So thank you for thank joining you, us from the UK, Dave. Uh, Steve is here and Christina says it looks like an amazing book. So Christina, you. if you want to get a copy, we can get a copy to you. <laughs> now, gentlemen, I have two things I want to add. The first one is something for Daniel. 
because I want to show a copy of that book plate that Carl that Sandberg familiar. helped design for us. And this one with Lucas's signature on it is the one you will be getting if you order Lincoln and the American found again. What do you have to say about Carl Sandburg and our book plate? <laughs> well, actually, that logo was used for the Prairie Years. Uh, the publisher in 1926 needed needed the back of a of a pamphlet to uh, to us book dealers touting Prairie Years. Buy them, put them on your shelves, and they wanted something on the back, and they asked. Carl to produce something, and that's what he did, the hat and umbrella. And then in, uh, back then in 1938, when Ralph Newman decided to make the Abraham Lincoln Bookshop, well, it became that in 41, but to specialize, he asked Carl, could he use that? Well, Carl said, sure. So since that time, we've been using Carl's hat and umbrella. Thanks for right, Thank you, Dan. And then I do have a question for you, Lucas, and it comes from uh, Brian Steenbergen. And Brian wants to know, or asks, can you discuss similarities of political philosophies and perspectives on the Declaration of Independence between Lincoln and Frederick Douglass? Wow, great question. And thank you for bringing up Frederick Douglass. He's uh, my second hero after Lincoln. My Twitter handle is Lincoln Douglass, one word, but make sure you spell Douglass with two S's or I'm giving you an F. Congratulations uh, anyway. for getting that handle. I'm going to dip out while you guys talk. Thank you. Just, um, just on that point, I'm going to interrupt real fast that uh, Stephen Douglass used two S's at the beginning of his life and then took off one of them. Interestingly, I have a letter right now from Camp Douglas, a Confederate who was a prisoner here in Chicago at Camp Douglas, and he puts Camp Douglas with two S's. Yeah, uh, Stephen Douglas, uh, was, his birth name was Douglas with two S's. And uh, Robert Johansson points out that in, in I believe, uh, 1848, Douglas drops the second S, and that, not so coincidentally, is the year that uh, Frederick Douglass comes back from his tour of the British Isles when he had to leave the country between 1845 and 47 because he named names in his narrative. And he was an outlaw, as you know, until he was uh, manumitted by his friends. Uh, so we suspect that, that Stephen Douglass didn't want anybody to think that he was even distantly related to Frederick Douglass because, as you know, uh, 10 years later, Douglass I think we just had uh, Lucas frozen. Is that correct? That is certainly what I'm getting on my end. Uh, I am too. And so he looks good. <laughs> he's in looking his good. Yeah. Black um, uh, so we we're, we're, we're back. back Sorry. With this. Lucas. Okay, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure. Are you, can you guys hear me now? We can. You were frozen for a moment. All right. Well, I don't know what you lost. I won't go back over that territory. But no. uh, Frederick Douglass begins to see the Constitution like Lincoln, not exactly, but like Lincoln. In other words, pro-freedom, pro what he called a glorious liberty document in 1852, something he did not believe in the 1840s. He was like William Lloyd Garrison, who believed the Constitution, because of its compromises with slavery, was a pro-slavery document. And Douglass, in fact, prior to 1852 said that it should be shivered into a thousand fragments. He changes in his mind after he starts his own newspaper, The North Star, um, co-edited with Martin Delaney, another uh, important black political activist. Um, and he starts reading more uh, arguments on behalf of the constitution as pro-liberty. Arguments from guys like uh, Lysander Spooner and Garrett Smith and Wendell Phillips. And he becomes persuaded that the, tool, the tools or levers of freedom actually can be found in the Constitution rather than by breaking up the Constitution and breaking up the Union. Where it's different is Douglas did not want to concede that any of the compromises with, with slavery actually applied technically to slaves. And so he, he put his faith in a somewhat peculiar interpretation of the slavery comp, uh, clauses uh, by Lysander Spooner in particular. And Lincoln, of course, believed what most Americans believed, which was 
No, those clauses apply to slavery. They're clearly compromises with slavery. But in Lincoln's mind, that did not uh, in, uh, blemish the Constitution uh, as severely as Frederick Douglass thought it would if he went with that interpretation. So um, on the main, they, they both thought that the best way to get rid of slavery was by keeping the union together. It's that old canard, right? Keep your friends close and your enemies closer. Garrison wanted our erring sisters to go, and Douglas said, no, you would not be absolving yourself of your responsibility. Slavery is an American institution, and it is up to Americans to get rid of it. And he went into great detail with uh, 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 criticizing William Lloyd Garrison on that point, thinking that the Constitution really is the key to emancipating slaves in the United States. Um, I want to ask a couple of very quick questions, uh, brief answers, please. I just want to get these in because sure. uh, I'm interested. He was about amendments to the Constitution. You amend the Constitution. Most of Lincoln's political life, he didn't like amendments, uh, yet he produced the 13th Amendment. How did his reasoning change? Um, I explain this um, later in my book uh, by essentially saying um, in amending the Constitution, Lincoln did not think uh, we were doing anything contrary to the preamble, contrary to, as it were, the mission statement of uh, America. He thought it was the full flowering or fulfillment of what the founders wanted to do. It took an amendment to complete what he began during the war, which was the Emancipation Proclamation. He was not sure that the Emancipation Proclamation would hold up in the Supreme Court. And remember, Ju uh, Chief Justice Taney was on the court until October of 1864. And so by that point in time, Lincoln really wanted emancipation not just to liberate current slaves, he wanted to explode the institution completely. And if the states refused to do it, the next best thing would be to do it by Congress's authority, supermajority in each house, house in the Senate, and then ultimately have the states ratify it. And by that point in time, enough minds had changed in the country that they were willing to actually secure that gain of the Civil War, which is emancipation of three to four million black people by amending the constitution to make it sure, to make it stick. Here's another thing off track real quickly. Well, because I didn't ask this when we were talking about George Washington for a moment, uh, with him being the founder in Lincoln, uh, how did he deal or think of Washington's own disloyalty to the king? There's, um, uh, he did, well, for one, he didn't spend a lot of time talking about that. He no, thought I bet that, not. He, but, but notice, there's a difference between uh, rebelling for your rights and rebelling against a regime that exists to secure rights. So there is no moral equivalency between what Lincoln, excuse me, what Washington and American revolutionaries did and say uh, Jeff Davis and uh, the rebellious citizens of 11 American states. There is a categorical difference between throwing off a regime of oppression and throwing off a regime simply because you lost an election and do not trust the incoming uh, uh, rulers and their party. And Lincoln was at pains in his first inaugural address, as you know, to explain why he was going to be a good winner in hopes that the poor losers would come back into the union. Why does that sound all current? All right, so uh, yeah. there's, a, there's a contradiction that I find uh, about slavery's end and Lincoln. And that is, you know, you talk about the George uh, Richardson letter that I think yes. is very important, the 1855 letter, where you say that spirit which is that what you say that what he said in the in the letter, Lincoln, that spirit which desired the peaceful extinction of slavery has itself become extinct with the occasion and the men of the revolution. He also said, though, there is no peaceful extinction of slavery in prospect for us. So a compromise had been necessary over slavery in the Constitution. Uh, and even though Lincoln himself was ready to accept slavery to keep the Union, he felt that placed slavery on the road to ultimate extinction. So was he correct in maintaining that publicly, that there, it could be peacefully extinguished, but he, he, he had to move public opinion toward that, but privately he felt 
war was the only way, much like John Brown felt for that matter, that it would be an extinction of slavery. Well, that letter to uh, Kentucky Judge uh, George Robertson that Lincoln uh, wrote in 1855, um, it is the only time Lincoln admits to anyone, at least on paper, uh, of his pessimism with regards to the trend on putting slavery on the course of alternative extinction. Remember, this is only one year after the Kansas-Nebraska Act was passed, and that really cut Lincoln to the quick. Uh, as you know, he gives arguably his greatest um, uh, speech, in, in, in other words, uh, beyond the Gettysburg Address and Second Inaugural, uh, at Peoria in October of 1854, which brings him back into politics with both feet because of what he thought the enormity of local popular sovereignty as enunciated by Stephen Douglas was in the, in the Kansas-Nebraska Act. So it's only, a, it's, it's less than a year after that act is, or it's about a year after that act is passed. And Lincoln thinks, good grief, are, are free whites of the North really giving up on the meaning of this country? Are they really becoming indifferent about the spread of slavery? Remember, this is, Lincoln called Stephen Douglas insidious. Lincoln doesn't throw words like that around, uh, at least not in the 1850s, earlier in life maybe, but not in the 1850s. He called Stephen Douglas insidious, not because Douglas was in favor of slavery, but because he was tempting free white Northerners not to care what would happen to people who don't look like them. That is to say, what would happen to black people in the federal territories. And Lincoln said, do you realize by becoming indifferent towards the spread of slavery, it will actually become national as a result. And for him, that was the enemy. That was the thing, that was the front burner issue, not trying to convince Southerners to give up their slaves. He had to make sure that white free people of the North didn't allow slavery to spread into the territories. So in 1855, to circle back to George Robertson, that's the one time he tells George Rob Robertson, I don't think this thing is gonna be done peacefully, but, Remember the next year, he's up, he tries to get the nomination uh, and the appointment as senator, uh, loses by only five votes in the state house. He could have become senator uh, in, in uh, January of 1857 and comes really close to winning. Um, that's a whole other story. So um, at that point, Lincoln says, it may be in my heart of hearts, I'm really, uh, I'm really pessimistic about the opportunity because uh, or, or the options here because the trend doesn't look good. And this is before Dred Scott in 57. But publicly, he had to play the only game that was acceptable at that time, which was peacefully make the appeal, go to the ballot box, not bullets, as he says later. Let's see if we can shape public opinion to do this the peaceful, the gradual way. Well, as many of the viewers might know, I'm a son of a psychoanalyst. And I understand it's the only time he really let that out on a paper. He wrote private on it. Yes. Yet, that was in his mind. And as a son of a psychoanalyst, uh, I think that that was there. He felt it and it uh, imbued what came later, even though he knew the only way to go at the moment was peaceful. But that goes to that nationalization we're talking about. That was Lincoln's red line. And I think that was the most important policy decision he made ever is to stop that nationalization after he was president-elect and his own party was even saying, hey, there's gonna be war, or secession, and you know, maybe we should compromise. No, he said he, he was inflexible on that particular issue, the territorial issue. So, but he was also the first president to let the war come. He was ready to yeah. have that war if necessary, and he let it come. I don't know if unconsciously it was there that, okay, if it has to be, it has to be, because it might have to be, he let it come. Well, uh, and you're, uh, that's a deliberate allusion, of course, to the second paragraph of the second inaugural, and the war, or, and the war came. Um, but we have to remember here, Lincoln understood his war as a war of self-defense. It had to be an action taken by the rebels first, and then he thought it was incumbent upon him, as he says in his first inaugural address, to defend the nation. He, of course, is the only person in the federal government whose oath is spelled out verbatim in the Constitution, right? To preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. He believed that he, an oath before God, he had no choice 
and that the American people expected him to defend the country. What he's also defending here, remember, is not simply a policy that the Republicans won on, right? 180 electoral votes under the Constitution. He was president, didn't matter what the popular vote was. What was incumbent upon him was not simply to stand up for the platform of the Republican Party. He was standing up for our democratic way of life. What do I mean by that? In a republic, as I teach my students, requires two things, good winners and good losers. The South, the rebels were being poor losers, bad losers, unlike what the Republicans did in 1856 when they lost, when Fremont lost, the first time Republicans sent somebody up uh, for president. What did the Republicans do? Did they say, not my president? Did they preach resistance? No. They said, okay, Buchanan, he's a Democrat. He's a doe face, right? A Northern man of Southern principles, but he's the president. What is it incumbent upon us to do now for the next two years and four years, we are going to keep talking, hold rallies, you know, uh, publish newspapers and elect people that we really do believe understand the constitution and the purpose of this country better. And lo and behold, what happened? In 58, they gained seats. And in 60, their second bite of the apple, Lincoln is elected. Fair is fair. Democrats now must abide by a legitimately run um, election and the, the Southern faction refused to do it. They were in that respect, poor Americans, not because they were poor slave, pro-slavery, even though that's true. They were poor Americans because they were unwilling to govern themselves. They were unwilling to abide by a legitimate election and you cannot have viable self-government if that happens. That happens, they felt that, that's anarchy. Of course, they felt that was their basic way of life. I'm not defending that. But that's certainly one of the things they were doing. And so now many, when the, when the war was coming, and we, we still say, was it for union or was it for slavery? Yeah, Lincoln and others certainly felt it was a slavery, but union was so important, it was together. And the unity of the United States was important, he's thought, for a Republican democracy, yes? Yes. To both America and the world. So the argument of what started the war and what, kept it going, the need for union or the need for slavery really is a unitary idea. You need the union to get the end of slavery. Yes. There's no end of slavery without union. That's, that's an argument in your book, no? Agreed, yes. Lincoln thought that the, that the way to emancipation was precisely through the levers of freedom that were uh, enshrined in the Constitution with, with its compromises, but it was enshrined in the Constitution. And to lose the Constitution would be to lose uh, the fundamental way that we would get rid of, of slavery over time. Bjorn, you have someone who wishes to ask a question. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. I have a couple of questions. And one thing I've noticed in these uh, conversations over Facebook is that when we get to the last few minutes of the conversation, everybody who's been watching for 45 or 50 minutes suddenly gets questions <laughs> and that they want to ask them. And we thank them for that. Uh, it does mean that we may not get to your question if you don't ask it, you know, in the first half of the show, but we will try to respond to it in the comments section. And I don't know whether Lucas would be able to chime in later. Bring them my way and I'll do what I can. Okay, yeah, sure. And then but we certainly, Daniel and myself, might be able to, you know, respond on Facebook later. Now, we have two questions that I want to shoot out real quick. And one of them uh, from Jim Johnson suggests the question that you were just talking about, Daniel and Lucas. But it also refers to something that our friend Brian Dirk, who also has been on this show and teaches a lot, te tells his students which is to remember slavery is not always race and race is not always slavery. And so Jim Johnson asks us to ask Lucas to respond. One of the current radical themes is that Lincoln himself was racist. All that I know from my reading is that that is not the case and how can you respond to that claim? Well, I will be responding at book length <laughs> in a few years. That is, I'm on sabbatical right now, academic year 2020, 2021. And of course, with the virus, everybody thinks I have spectacular timing, but no, that's in, that's in God's providence. Um, that is the front burner project that I'm working on right now. The title of my current project is Lincoln. Oh, again, that happened. 
too many people using the internet at the same time. It could be. Happened at the perfect, at the perfectly ironic time. We, I imagine that Lucas will be back in a minute as he was yes. before. Well, uh, I'm going to. Uh, I, if, yeah, if you have a comment, if you have an opinion, Dan. Oh, here opinion. we are. Here we are. Are we on? Are we on now? We are. No. Can you guys hear me at this point? Okay, yes. so my, the book project I have is Lincoln, Race, and the Fragile American Republic. Um, I'm going to take on all the controversial stories um, and statements of Lincoln. The most controversial were probably during the Lincoln-Douglas debates of 1858, where he says, I've, not, I've never been uh, in favor of, nor am I in favor of giving blacks the vote. I'm not in favor of perfect social, political, and civil equality. Why, does he, why is he forced to say these things? He's compelled to say these things because he is speaking to a predominantly white supremacist audience. Yes, it's a free state. Yes, it's a frontier state, but um, color bigotry is pervasive in Illinois as it was in Indiana, as it was in the territory of Oregon. Black people in the 1850s, they passed a law in Illinois. White people passed a law saying black people could not immigrate to Illinois. They cannot serve on the militia. They cannot vote. They cannot serve on juries where whites are a defendant. That is the context within which Stephen Douglas categorically says this country was founded on the white basis. He was like the George Wallace of his day. On the white basis, today, tomorrow, forever. That is Stephen Douglas. So if, if Lincoln played the race card, which I don't believe he did, Douglas played the whole deck. So what does Lincoln have to do? In a state where not a single black person is allowed to vote, Lincoln has to start not where, where he stands, but where his the electorate stands and where the voters are, he's going to try to get them not to you know, airdrop onto his island. He's going to try to build a bridge from where they are, which is informed not just by reason, but by prejudice and by practice. And so what he wants to do is he wants to nudge them forward. He can't even have a conversation about the vote unless he can assure them of what they know in their hearts, which is what? That Black people are equal in a fundamental natural respect. And that is what he learned from the Declaration, which he claims applies to them, which is what? That their birthright, that their endowment from God is life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, all of the individual rights. He says those natural rights, they are the equal of me, the equal of Judge Douglas, the equal of every living man and woman. And yeah, so he's, he was saying, even though they may not be, uh, uh, Black might not be equal in all respects, he had those certain inalienable rights, he or she. But at the same time, Lincoln still was a 19th century white man. Yes. And we can't take everything away from that. There, he was, he grew. That's one thing about him. And I think he was trying to get those others that were not able to grow to grow. And even that's what he said about it. But he was even thinking that the Southerners themselves had a certain idea of the humanity yes. of the Black, that yes. they were not really chattel because there were free Blacks in society. And they were not taken care of as all chattel would be. They were actually living lives. So that uh, he, he did feel that even the Southerners themselves thought there was a basic humanity to the black person. And notice, if it's going to be the case that Congress can't make white Southerners free their slaves, the Southerners have to come to that conclusion themselves politically. What does Lincoln do? Does he condemn them? He condemns slavery, but he recognizes, I've got to persuade them to do the right thing. And so what does he do in his Peoria address, October 1854, what does he do? He, it's like he's, he's blowing the embers of their conscience, keeping that alive by saying what? Interesting, you let your your white little babies play with the babies of slaves, but you don't let them come anywhere near the children of slave traders. Why is that? Why do you avoid shaking hands? Why don't you uh, invite them to your parties? Isn't it because you know in your heart of hearts that there is something humane about treating them like mere articles of merchandise? And Lincoln himself says that these people who would do this would deserve kickings and death. And I thought, death, Lincoln, you're kind of exaggerating there, aren't you? And he's like, no, that is an allusion to the penalty for slave traders, execution, capital punishment, that yes, people who would make fellow human beings under the common God and father of us all, as he told Nathaniel Gordon, page 42 of my book, <laughs> that 
Look, for you to do that deserves that penalty. You know in your heart of hearts that turning human beings into mere articles of merchandise is despicable. And so he's trying to, as it were, instead of pointing the accusing finger, he comes alongside Southerners. He's a son of Kentucky after all. And he says, I know your situation, walk with me and let's get to a place where we will all admit out loud what you know in your heart of hearts, slavery's wrong, it's an evil and it has to be treated as such. I have three, three things that I need to get, I wanna get in. So we're gonna go a little bit longer. All right, shorter, shorter right, answers, I'll try. Dan, I'm going to pop right in here just to say I'm going to thank Bill Shepard for his question and say that we're going to try to respond to it on uh, our comments because we are getting into the into the last moments of our uh, show and I want Dan to uh, to be able to get his questions in as well. Yeah, there are three three areas I want to get into. One kind of quickly is that with the ultimate extinction, it, it would take time. Let it die on the vine. And some, are, some say that, well, the cotton gin came up and that would have been the death knell of slavery. I'm not so sure about that. I, that's why, you know, why put it off? You know, maybe that's where the abolitionists were not incorrect. If you put it off, on, that's on the backs of decades of future people that yeah. are gonna be enslaved. And they might just go from the field when the cotton gin takes over into the factories. They're certainly not going to get away from households. They'd still be there. And I think slavery would have gone a long distance myself. So thankfully, we had that, uh, that war to stop it. Uh, now, two things I wanted to uh, go into that are a little off, but not. One is leadership. I want to ask about Lincoln's leadership and what you think of it. Um, I have here, because today is the 75th anniversary of the dropping of the bomb on Hiroshima. And that is, that's the atomic age. It happens to be that I have a $2 bill here from a collection we have on, from a man who was on, I did this on one of my YouTube uh, uh, videos, you can go back to it, on the Nagasaki collection from a guy named Gallagher who was here in Chicago who was on box car that bombed Nagasaki. And this is from his collection. And here is all of them. And also, let me see if I'm writing here is Tibbetts right here, signing this $2 bill where both uh, of the crew uh, signed. Also in his collection is this Time Magazine, only for the Pacific. And in fact, it, shows that here the atomic age is upon us. There are both the two bombs and they're under the atomic age and there are the two bombs, Nagasaki and Hiroshima before it, which were there today. And in fact, in this collection is interesting. This was the, again, the Nagasaki part, but here on August 9th, the second drop of the atomic bomb, he had to write out 12 pages. The moment they got back and landed, they wrote out exactly what they saw on their trip over Nagasaki. So it's in our minds today. Now, why I'm getting into leadership with that is that just this morning, they were talking about that and John Meacham talked about Truman's leadership and how he made the presidency vital by that decision and others that happened and how important leadership is certainly from the from the, in the time of war, and it's the capacity of the person at the top. So Meacham talked about Truman and his decision to drop that bomb, creating an American century, or at least a half century, certainly. Mm -hmm. I was thinking how Washington embodied leadership, being a unifier, even stepping down, and how he was such a leader at a time when we needed at a crisis in our, in our time. Lincoln also embodied leadership, and I, and I consider the nationalization of slavery, the stopping of it, probably the most important leadership policy that he had. But each of these men, Truman, Washington, Lincoln, 
proved consequential to post-war, each of those wars, America, helped define America, created a framework that strengthened America. And these were three creative presidents. Each were in Dean Acheson's book, Present at the Creation. So talk to us briefly about how you assess Lincoln as a leader, how he achieved that leadership. Well, he is, uh, has, to be, uh, has to be seen as one of the most unlikely people to become president given his upbringing and background and lack of executive training. I mean, compared to Jefferson Davis, right? I mean, you could just check the boxes in so many ways for Jeff Davis where, it, where that's just utterly lacking for Lincoln. Uh, and so what it shows is are his signature or signal strengths uh, are, are strengths that we don't typically, um, uh, well, let's just say we don't typically find it in every politician. Lincoln was certainly ambitious, uh, but uh, one of the strongest things, in fact, the strongest thing he had uh, was his mind and his logic and uh, his ability to um, uh, persuade, right? His rhetoric. His rhetoric. Without his rhetoric, he would not have become a political leader in Illinois, and no way would he have become president. I mean, William, a nominee of the Republican Party against guys like Chase, Seward, Bates. I mean, you name it. Uh, Harper's Weekly has that. I'm sure you're familiar with it. That centerfold piece that has Seward in the middle, and all the rest were constellations or, or, or stars around him. Who is the last person mentioned in that article? leading to the May 1860 uh, Republican convention. It's Lincoln. He's got two short paragraphs. So uh, Lincoln's leadership was precisely um, the genius to recognize how important public opinion was and to be able to craft language in, in a plain way, but articulate uh, way that can, can uh, communicate with uh, uh, the, the common man and, and voter uh, but for that, uh, we, we would not have uh, seen Lincoln enter the, the national stage. So it, it's his rhetoric far and away. You know, that's the, the, the uh, 19 of the top 20 qualities of Lincoln. <laughs> so before we get to the closing part of this show, uh, I want to go back to the commission that you're on right now, the 250th anniversary coming up in 2026. Uh, you're on that commission. I remember the Freedom Train that came out in 1974, two years before. Or 76, probably. Hmm? I'm or, sorry? Or 76? Well, oh, it came out in 74. There was okay. a Freedom Train started as a lead up to, oh, gotcha. uh, to the 76 celebration. So, right. what uh, I just want to ask you tell us what you can. I mean, it's six years away, but uh, what are the initial ideas that are starting to percolate? for the celebration and the education of, of the 250th. What will the emphasis be? Might trust in American institutions be a focus to bring, that, to bring us back as a nation uh, to encompass the unity that we have with diversity? It's another contradiction. The United States, uh, is un we need unity yep. in our diversity. So I what's was... going to happen with the commission? I would say that the, the front burner issue for us is uh, we know that this enterprise can only succeed if people today, as diverse as we are in so many different ways in America, as diverse as Americans are today, we will be successful only if they can look back to 1776 in the way that Lincoln did and find that people that it will be a unifying thing, not a divisive thing. And so they have to have an understanding intellectually. They have, to have, they have to come to understand our history as not simply one bad thing after another, but rather something that began and reached its full flowering or is reaching its full flowering, as Obama would put it, right? Perfecting our union over time. We believe that 76 can be a unifying thing even though slavery was present there, even though uh, we had that very fractious relationship with the Indian tribes and nations there, that we can, every American today can look back to 76 and find in the declaration themselves, see themselves there and say that yes, in a fundamental way, we all are created equal. We all possess rights 
by nature. Government should not be imposed upon us but for our consent and permission. And that as each state, after the original 13 colonies turned states, became a part of the union. So we can take this all the way up through Puerto Rico and American Samoa and everyone who consider themselves American can say that their state became a part of this thing that was connected to something true and good and noble at the founding, even though it wasn't practically secured for everybody, the, the principles were true there. And the structures were established, even with the compromises, the structures were established in a constitution. That by the way, for example, and this year we're celebrating, right? The, uh, the amendment that gave women the right to vote. There is nothing in the United States constitution that barred women from voting. It was states that barred women from voting. And there were certain states that actually allowed women to vote and the United States Constitution did not get in their way. So there were so many ways in which the United States Constitution was with a small p progressive and liberating that we don't typically associate with it because we think, oh, wait a second, didn't that have to be amended later to allow that to happen? It had to be amended because the states were preventing that from happening. And so we're hoping that if our educating effort works and that has to be decentralized throughout all the states, as the states come on board with their own commissions, as they are doing, that as the word gets out, as education gets out, as historical instruction gets out, people will see, you know what? I am a part of this country, not just now, but because of what was true back then in 1776. I was, in fact, a gleam in George Washington's eye, a man who could not have children of his own. Well, certainly that's well put, and I hope that we learn from this commission. I, I, uh, I truly hope that you're successful in turning us around in that regard. I didn't get to something I was going to talk about is that the statues of Washington and Jefferson, even Lincoln may be coming down, but certainly Jefferson and Washington because they own slaves and didn't give them up during their lifetimes, yet they were part of the Constitution to try to produce a country in the future that would allow slavery to end. Washington so, Free knows he had authority over legally in his will, and Lincoln points that out, and Frederick Douglass points that out. Hmm. So I'm now going to start to end this by talking about the House Divided, uh, the rest of our schedule this fall, August 27th, a Thursday at 3.30 p.m. Central Time. Uh, Carl Guarnieri, will be here with Lincoln's informer, Charles Dana, and the inside story of the Union War. This is a fun, interesting book. Charles Dana is not known as much as he should be. And Carl is going to give us a, a good work on that subject, well-written. And I think that you're going to enjoy the book and learn something about a man who's kind of sub Rosa, not known as well. So that's August 27th. September 16th, our good friend uh, Pete Cousins is going to come in. He's a Civil War and Native American War uh, historian. He's going to come up with Tecumseh and the Prophet. First book on Tecumseh in a long time and certainly bringing up the Prophet as well, who was important to the time. It's going to be on the release date, his first book event, September 16th. I hope you will join us for that. October 6th, H.W. Brands, who's a well-known American historian to all of us. His book, The Zealot and the Emancipator, John Brown, Abraham Lincoln, and the Struggle for American Freedom. Also something, oh, Quran, that we could use. So that's October 6th with Brands. And then at the end of uh, October, October 29th, Durf, Jack Durf, who was a cartoonist, on his book, Kent State, Four Dead in Ohio, a fascinating graphic novel. He was the author of my friend Dahmer, if you might remember that, in a graphic novel. So those are the ones coming up. Keep informed by coming back to, by, by being on our email list at A House Divided, and we look forward to seeing you there. So Bjorn, I'm going to let you take us up. All right, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Lucas, for joining us today. And thank you, Dan, for hosting the show. This has been A House Divided from, a Lincoln, from Abraham Lincoln Bookshop. 
Uh, if you wish to purchase a copy of Lincoln and the Founders, you can do that. There's a link right there in the comments that I talked about before. Or of course, you can go to alincolnbookshop.com, our website, alincolnbookshop.com, and find it. Dan told you when to expect the next event. It's Carl Guarneri later this month. So look for notifications about that. And we will see you back here that at that time. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you again soon.